with only 13 days left until the election, early voters head to the polls and in record numbers. And you may be paying more to ride the bus soon, but it all has to do with parking. We'll tell you why. We've all heard about concussions in football, but you might be surprised which sport comes in second for the most concussions. Carolina Week starts now. From the UNC School of Journalism and Mass Communication, covering Carolina in HD, this is Carolina Week. The election is almost two weeks away, but votes are being cast in Chapel Hill and around the state. Good evening, I'm Avery Harper. And I'm Alex Giles. Early voting is underway, and so far, all indications are that more people are voting than four years ago. One of the places to cast those early ballots is here at Ramshead Dining Hall, and students have been exercising that option. That appears to be the case elsewhere. On the first day of early voting alone across North Carolina, officials report almost 50,000 more people voted early than four years ago. So what does that, all that voting mean? Will the president eke out another win in the Tar Heel state? Or will Governor Romney, still relishing his first debate performance, take the state? Avery and I take a look at those questions and others in this special election report. First time voter Kiara Campbell is a devout Christian. She's struggling to pick a candidate in this November's presidential election. She says neither candidate appeals to her values. So I'd rather not vote than vote for something that I disagree with. In accordance with her faith, she says she doesn't support same-sex marriage. Last May, the state's voters overwhelmingly passed Amendment 1, which banned it. Vote for marriage on May 8th. The passage came the day before President Obama announced his support for same-sex marriage. For me personally, it is important for me to go ahead and affirm that uh, I think same-sex couples should be able to get married. That comment has landed the president in hot water with Campbell and other black religious voters in North Carolina. Voting against our faith for a secular choice is basically how we view choosing the world over God, and you sh shouldn't do that. Many African-American religious leaders supported Amendment 1. So did their congregations. Pastor Andy Thompson leads a congregation 10,000 strong at World Overcomers Christian Church in Durham, North Carolina. He says election season has left his congregation conflicted. It can put an African-American Christian in a real quandary as to what they are supposed to do. He's not encouraging his congregation to vote for either party. I'm not right wing. I'm not left wing. It takes both wings to fly the plane. Blacks make up 22% of the state population. They came out heavily in support of Obama in 2008. He took the state with only 14,000 more votes than John McCain. The results weren't known for days it was so close. Professor Jim Johnson studies demographics at UNC Chapel Hill's Keenan Flagler Business School. He says the political trends in North Carolina are moving away from traditional stereotypes. I don't think it's smart that to uh, uh, to take for granted that all blacks are Democrats. Professor of Southern politics Farrell Guillory says North Carolina's diverse electorate doesn't vote solely on social issues. We've got to realize that most voters aren't just single issue voters. They, are, they, they live their lives in many dimensions and they will look at candidates not only on a particular issue, but on a range of issues. College students were some of the president's biggest supporters four years ago, but that support may have softened. And the Young Democrats president, Austin Gilmore, says his group has upped efforts to register voters on campus. We know that turnout is really the name of the game this time around. And Gilmore says African Americans should be sympathetic to the plight of same-sex couples. Um, and honestly, African Americans um, should not be so short-sighted as to forget that um, the same ideological underpinnings that are supporting um, laws that uh, prohibit uh, same-sex couples from getting married, from having the same types of benefits, that same exact type of logic was used to support Jim Crow. Chairman of the North Carolina Federation of College Republicans, Greg Steele, says he isn't worried about social issues. For a lot of younger Republicans, a lot of us are saying, let's get away from social issues, let's fix this economy. And he's confident his candidate will snag North Carolina in the presidential election. I, I, think, uh, I think we've got North Carolina locked up. Campbell says she's looking for divine intervention to help her with her first time at the polls. Hopefully by the time of the election, um, my prayers will have been answered to guide me to whether I should vote and whether or who I should vote for. As election day approaches, undecided voters like Campbell, conflicted by social conservatism and liberal political views, could very well make the difference in an already tight race. 
The Obama campaign isn't taking any chances. There's evidence of that in Chapel Hill. Michelle Obama spoke to a crowd of 5,700 in Carmichael Arena last week. The first lady, of course, was advocating for her husband's reelection and urged those listening to vote early. Ms. Obama said North Carolina would play a critical role in the election. Now, we've been talking about early voting. You must be registered in Orange County. If you haven't registered yet and you live in the county, you can fill out a same-day registration form and still vote at an early voting site. Here are the closest sites for UNC students to vote. The Ram's Head Dining Hall site is open every weekday from noon to 7 p.m. until November 2nd. It will be open on sat Saturday, November 3rd, from 9 a.m. until 3 p.m. Or you can vote at Carborough Town Hall every weekday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. until November 2nd. That site will also be open Saturday, October 27th and Saturday, November 3rd from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. You may be paying more to ride the bus soon, and Michael Whiteman reports it really has to do with parking. These students may not have to pay to get on this bus, but that doesn't mean that they won't soon be paying more for transportation. More than $23 more, assuming the higher administration approves a proposed transit fee increase. The hike is part of a plan to shift costs from the university's parking services onto the students. UNC Police Chief Jeff McCracken says the increase is essential to keep the transit system operational. We certainly cannot sustain the way we have been doing it. Right now, the bus system is subsidized by campus parking at a price of $1.5 million every year. McCracken says the university can't afford to continue doing that. It became obvious that it would not be sustainable to continue to try to subsidize transit at the rate we have by parking. Over the five years of the plan, we reduced that subsidy by $500,000. But not everyone's on board. Michael Bertucci is the president of the Graduate and Professional Student Federation. The fee has set to increase not just this year, but significant increases over the next three years as well. Um, so a lot of students felt by approving this increase, um, they're also kind of approving more like the five-year plan and the increases that are to follow, and that's where students were dissatisfied. Currently, students make up 80% of Chapel Hill Transit's ridership and contribute around 30% of the budget through student fees. Under a DPS five-year plan, students would see their contribution to the transit budget increase to more than 40% over the next three years. Bertucci is concerned about expansion for the transit system, too. There is no indication in the five-year plan for any sort of increases in service or revisions of the, of the lines uh, because of the plan, yet we see really large increases in our fee. Despite student complaints, McCracken remains optimistic that the fee hike will be approved. I, there, there's always concern, and we realize this, when, when you talk about increasing student fees especially when economics are tough as they are now. So th there certainly will be some concern and some discussion, but I certainly am hopeful that in the end they will agree to what we have proposed. Reporting Chapel Hill, I'm Michael Whiteman. Chapel Hill and Carborough are partners in the Chapel Hill Transit System with UNC. Together, the towns contribute roughly $10 million of the system's $19 million budget. It's no surprise tuition is going up for the next school year. A $600 increase has already been approved for in-state students, and it could cost out-of-state students an extra $1,700 next year. That means tuition for the entire year would be more than $28,000. Even if that increase goes through, UNC's out-of-state tuition would be in line with current costs at neighboring universities. At the University of Maryland, for example, it's more than $25,000. Georgia is almost $26,000. Out-of-state students at the University of South Carolina pay more than $27,000. And at the University of Virginia, it's more than $34,000. A decision is still a ways off. And it won't be long, graduation. And now we know who will be the commencement speaker. Steve Case, co-founder of AOL, will be the speaker in the spring. Chancellor Thorpe says he chose Case because of his philanthropy and entrepreneurial endeavors. Teach for America, it's UNC's top employer of graduating seniors. That's right. We'll tell you more after the break. Connect with us online by liking the Carolina Week Facebook page and following us on Twitter at Carolina Week UNC. Brush, brush. 
brushy brush, brushy brush, brush your teeth. to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. Here we go. We're going we're going to make some juice. It's going to be good. She's excited. A little bit of kale. Please don't put this on I'm putting it all over the line. It's wet. It needs something. No, it'll go. Don't break my juicer. Looks good. You ready to try it? Come on, baby. Try. Challenge your kids to be active and eat healthy. It's okay. okay. Like it. all right. They might surprise you. I actually took another sip. You saw it? Search We Can for more ideas on how you and your kids can get healthy together. Alex, do you know what you'll be doing after graduation? Uh, hopefully getting a job at some point, Avery. <laughs> well, if you're trying to figure out what you'll be doing after graduation, you might want to consider Teach for America. That's right, UNC ranks third as the largest contributor to the Teach for America Corps. Reporter Brianna Harper tells us why some recent graduates choose this popular path. She already knows what she plans to do after graduation, Teach for America. You should think about applying for this since you want to teach. And then I looked into the program and I really liked it, so I decided to apply. Bauckham is among the 8% of UNC senior class that applied for Teach for America this year. And if selected, she would transform from student to teacher, much like the other 542 UNC alumni who have taught as core members. And I also think it makes it more of a selective process coming from UNC, because that means more people are going to want to do it, and they're going to really be looking at who they want to choose. It's clear that UNC's Teach for American following continues to grow. But what exactly is the motivation behind this recruitment increase on our campus? I think students at UNC are leaders, and they want to be leaders both here on campus and in the community, both now and in the long term in their careers. University Career Services reports that in years past, Teach for America has been the number one employer for UNC graduates. And this year looks to be no different. Um, we want UNC to continue to be a top producing school. In order to do that, we want to continue to bring in somewhere between 75 and 100 core members. For Bauckham and many other applicants, Teach for America serves as the ultimate opportunity to build their futures and others. Be passionate about teaching. Make sure it's something that you know you want to do, that you like to do, because in the end, it's not really about you. It's about the students that you're teaching. In Chapel Hill, I'm Brianna Harper. If you're interested in applying for Teach for America, the next deadline to submit the online application is November 2nd. If you apply for a job working for the town of Carborough, you might notice something missing on the job application. The Car Carborough Board of Aldermen voted to eliminate the checkbox asking if the applicant had ever been convicted of a felony or misdemeanor. The board hopes this change will eliminate discrimination against convicted criminals looking for jobs. The town will continue to conduct full background checks on all job applicants. Carbo is one of the first municipalities in the state to eliminate this box from job applications. UNC students traveled across the country on a su this summer on a quest for water. The project may be award-winning, but it could be a dud for some people. Reporter Jordan Powell tells us more. Water. We all use it. We all need it and nine UNC students traveled thousands of miles to tell us about it. Under the Powering a Nation program, the students came back and told their story in a rather unique way. Program producer, Laura Rule. The whole idea between this, behind this Carnegie Knight initiative was to innovate in journalism, was to try to do stories in different ways. And so making the story more interactive, making the user more in control of their experience. On the project website, 100gallons.com, the user decides which story is told and controls the way they hear and see it. Project editor John Casby worries that it may be too complex. 
I definitely wouldn't say that we, we designed this for the general audience. It was a lot riskier and a lot newer. And um, yeah, we may, we may have failed in that aspect of the site. That said, Casby is a finalist in a national competition for his work filming and editing the project. Rule and Casby both know the challenges of creating such a unique site, but both are optimistic that, with time, the concept will flow easier for users. Reporting from Chapel Hill, I'm Jordan Powell. You've heard of paying it forward. Now the Morrison community is taking that idea one step further, for kindness. If you look closely, you may see these bracelets on the wrists of almost 1,100 students. They're part of a program called Actively Caring for People that got its start at Virginia Tech. Morrison's community director, Terrace Mullins, brought it to UNC last year. You wear the bracelet, someone does something kind for you, and you give the bracelet to them. Then you can go to the program's website to read about acts of kindness around the world. The internet could be the part of one Franklin Street bank closing its doors. What used to be the Bank of America Center now sits empty with these signs. Bank officials say more people are using online banking, and that takes away from business at an office location. The things people used to do inside the bank, people can now do from their homes. The Bank of America opened an ATM across the street. Up next, meteorologist Drew Day tells us what to expect for this weekend's football game. When we beat NC State. get anywhere quickly. You don't want your friends to be annoyed, so you text. You're on your way. Five seconds is the average time your eyes are off the road while texting while driving. Make sure you get where you're going. I help you find a home. I help you find a home. Hey, maybe you'll be picnic. Maybe you'll be picnic. We've been caged together too long. We've been caged together too long. How come nobody ever picks me? Maybe they're looking for somebody different. Pick me. Well, the shelter's closing up for another day. We didn't get picked. I know. Tomorrow. Guaranteed. Looking for these? You drive buzzed. Could be one very expensive ride. First, you gotta make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving because buzz driving is drunk driving. All right, welcome back to Carolina Week, everyone. I'm Drew Day. Thank you so much for staying with us. It was a sunny and warm day across the area today. We also anticipate the chance of some showers later on this weekend on Saturday, but it's a small chance, and we'll talk about that in a few moments. And of course, we'll also talk about what is now Hurricane Sandy. It could be passing close to North Carolina, and so we'll talk about Sandy in just a minute, but first, a little bit more about our local weather here. Across the, uh, the area today, you can see from the satellite picture, it was nice and sunny, clear skies, a few little clouds up to the north. With that but that was about it. And then as we back out now and take a look at the nationwide satellite imagery, this is our next system that we're watching for our weather. It's this mass of clouds right here. That is in association with the cold front that again will bring us that slight chance of showers on Saturday. This cold front will also have a pretty interesting impact on Hurricane Sandy. So as we go down to the Caribbean right now and talk about Sandy, you can see here is the center of circulation right in here. It made landfall on Jamaica earlier today and it's forecast to continue to move on to the north. Here is the current location of Sandy. It will move across the, uh, the island of Cuba and then through the other islands of the Caribbean and then closer to North Carolina as of the current forecast track. It would then during the in the cone of the forecast track, it would bring it perhaps close to North Carolina. But what you really want to pay attention to is this line right here. That's where the center of the storm is expected to go. And so we really anticipate that it will be far enough offshore because of that cold front I just mentioned for it to push Sandy offshore and that way it will not make landfall along the North Carolina coast. 
So that is certainly good news for us, but it could impact some of the New England states later on this week. So as we take a look at the surface map, here's Sandy down here. You can really watch that, but I want us, what I want us to really focus on is that cold front because that's what really is going to be impacting our weather. We had this high pressure system across the area today, but that will continue to push to the east and break down. There's the cold front off to the west. And so that by Thursday evening, Sandy's down here, still churning off in the Caribbean, but there's the cold front just off to our west, continuing to move ever closer so that by Friday morning, it's moving through the Mississippi River, River Valley, and then again, it will move in our direction throughout the day on Saturday. So as we take a look at your forecast for tonight, expect to see clear skies across the area and light winds, a low temperature of 53. For tomorrow morning, it'll be sunny across the area, much like today, warm once again with 79. And then by 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, once again, sunny with 53, 71 by noon, and then 67 by 8 p.m. And so as we take a look at the five-day forecast now, Expect again to see 79 degrees with sunny skies across the area tomorrow, 75 for Friday. Again, there's that slight chance of rain on Saturday, but it likely won't amount to a whole lot. That's good. You know, now the weather sounds good, Drew, but a little birdie told me that you go to NC State. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I do. And how do you I feel about this football game coming up? Well, I figure that after five wins and an embarrassing loss to Duke, I think <laughs> it'll pretty be okay for Saturday. I'm not too concerned. Whoa, whoa. All right. You guys have a good weather program. We'll see just how good football program we is We won't on Saturday. hold your wolf well, pack that, colors against you. I don't know. You. With that little chance of rain on Saturday, I'm sure the football team won't want to risk getting wet. <laughs> well, so, thanks, Drew. Thank but you. may the best team win. <laughs> Thanks, sir. You're welcome. Football and concussions. We've heard a lot about that. But other sports are affected, too. We'll tell you more after the break. Stopbullying.gov. My name's Reggie. Just recently, my wife and I took in her sister's children. And we already had four, so I went from becoming a family man to a man with a bigger family. <clears throat> now, you can't eat love, so I don't know how I'm going to feed them tonight. How was that, Reggie? I think I look more like Denzel. That's cold, man. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Welcome back to Carolina Week. I'm Will Reimer. Look, I know we all want to forget Saturday's loss to Duke, but it happened. That's the bad news. The good news is the football team has a chance to beat another rival this weekend. Or does it? Julian Caldwell asked that question. UNC hasn't beaten rival NC State since 2006, but before asking if the streak will end this weekend, is NC State even a rival? And it's a big rivalry game. Well, obviously, we, you know, it's, I've been, uh, that's been pointed out to me since, uh, you know, the first handshake when I took the job. So this week, the heels aren't practicing just for themselves. That, that's what makes it so much fun, and especially for, you know, your fans. I mean, that, that's, their, that's their bragging rights. That's the thing that they, they get to talk about the entire year at the water cooler. So what do the biggest fans, the UNC students, think about the rivalry? They're definitely opponent and an opponent, and we'll have to take them seriously this weekend. But in general, I don't consider state as an equal. On a personal level, I consider, consider it a rivalry, but on a larger scale, they're not really that important to UNC students. <laughs> Duke's kind of like the twin brother, and, and State's kind of like the little brother that kind of just nags at you, but, but it always feels good to beat them. I think they think there's a rivalry. I don't know if there actually is. I think our actual rival is Duke, so. You're playing a bunch of farmers. Don't let us down. <laughs> 
Different opinions, but none of them wants to see this for another year. In Chapel Hill, I'm Julian Caldwell. Yeah, a bunch of farmers and a couple of weathermen. And when the Heels take on state, freshman linebacker Shaquille Rashad won't join them. The ACC suspended Rashad one game for his hit on Duke's Connor Vernon. He ran into the Duke player in between a play. Athletics director Bubba Cunningham was not happy with the suspension. Cunningham said in a statement, We are disappointed with the decision to suspend Rashad for a game. I don't understand how the conference, the ACC, can suspend a player who was involved in such an unusual play without speaking to him. Cunningham, Rashad, and Fedora say the hit was unintentional. Concussions, you've heard, of, you've heard about them a lot. Football players get them, but I found out that other athletes do too. Big hits. They cause concussions. Concussion causing collisions can happen on the soccer field too. Women's soccer is the second most concussed sport behind football. Leading concussion researcher Kevin Guskowitz. Typically, it's not a ball to head contact that causes concussion in soccer. It's usually a head to head contact as two players go up to, to make contact or to hit the ball. But not always. Guskowitz says women can't handle head trauma as well as men because women's necks aren't as strong as men's. Concussions are a part of the reason sophomore Farrell Sweeney quit playing soccer for the Tar Heel. Well, I've, I've gotten them so much that like I don't think I would know. If I don't feel normal, I don't know what feeling normal feels like. She's had five concussions. That she's told the doctor about. I've probably had like eight or so like really small, like only a couple day long concussions that I just haven't talk, told anybody about. And most of her concussions came from ball to head contact. The latest one happened just last spring in a drill working on heading technique. Geskowitz says proper technique is an important part of preventing concussions. There are a lot of individuals out there that think that we have to find this concussion-proof helmet or a concussion-proof mouth guard or uh, a headband in soccer, and I'm not convinced that it's going to be the protective equipment that's going to, to really uh, be the game changer. A game changer on both the football and the soccer field. UNC, we call it the University of National Champions. Drew Day doesn't, but we do. And athletes correct, re correct, collect rings even after they leave Chapel Hill. Former UNC women's basketball standout Erlena Larkins is a WNBA national champion. On Sunday, Larkins and the Indiana Fever beat the Minnesota Lynx for, the Indiana's, for Indiana's first title. Larkins played for the Heels from 2004 to 2008. She joins Camille Little and Nikki Teasley as former Tar Heels with WNBA championships. Little won hers with the Seattle Storm just two years ago. Nikki Teasley won a title with the Los Angeles Sparks back in 2002. And you know what, Alex, speaking of basketball, the men's basketball team has their first game Friday at 7.30 p.m. against Shaw. Hopefully the start to a great season. I'm sure it will be. Thanks, Will. You probably recognize this famous song. Students and faculty showed off their Michael Jackson moves in the pit. We'll tell you why next. If you have a story idea, call Carolina Week at 919-843-8292 or email us at carolinaweek at unc.edu. If you have questions about this program, write to Carolina Week, Campus Box 3365, UNCCH, Chapel Hill, North Carolina 27599. Be sure to check out Carolina Week online at carolinaweek.org. Turning a 20-foot wall into a canvas takes vision. So we're getting into college. I've got what it takes. So do you. If you were walking past the pit today, you may have seen a thrilling performance. <laughs> this morning, students got an early taste of Halloween. It was all for a good cause, promoting the fourth annual Eve Carson Ball. Students danced to Michael Jackson's Thriller, and student body president Will Limonstall and vice chancellor Winston Crisp showed off their moves. The ball will be held this Friday at Carolina Club. All proceeds will benefit the Eve Carson Scholarship. Avery, I didn't see you uh, out there doing the Thriller. Where were you? I mean, I I do it so well, and they, I mean, they didn't even invite me. The nerve of them. <laughs> I'll say, I'll say. No, no manners anymore. No, none. Well, thanks for watching. That does it for this edition of Carolina Week. Good night.